Vaidika. And that should be possible because this final lecture I'm talking about observations of primordial black holes, both constraints, how do we constrain them, and how could we hopefully detect them in the future? And also, what are the current hints, or what are, what's making people excited? Now, personally, I work on inflation, I work on formation mechanisms, I work on slow roll, or just slow roll, I don't work on observations. So here I'm really not talking at all about anything which is my own. I'm just going to hopefully give you a useful and brief summary of a huge number of observational constraints. Um, so the underlying question really will be how can we constrain or detect uh, primordial black holes? And well, when you are interested in primordial black, black holes being a dark matter candidate, the obvious way to phrase the constraint is in terms of this fraction, which I've introduced before. I'll write it again because it's very important. FPBH is those. The energy density in primordial black holes divided by the energy density fraction in dark matter today at the time t0. Okay? So once again, FPBH equals 1 means all of your dark matter are primordial black holes integrated over all masses and none is a new particle. Now that's good for the ones which are still around today, sufficiently massive. For lighter ones, for evaporated ones, or partially evaporated, it's better to use the constraint at the time of formation, which was beta. Okay. So beta was rho, again, energy density in primordial black holes, but this time not compared to the dark matter density, but compared to the total density. And not measured at the time today, but measured at the time of formation. Formation, remember, is when the relevant length scale which forms a black hole of a given size is equal to k, k is equal to ah. Okay. And these two we can relate um, by the fact that, you know, this one scales like a to the minus 3, total scales like radiation, a to the minus 4, internal matter radiation equality. And this is revision, so FPDH we can write as A equality over A formation times beta. And sometimes people actually use this as the definition of FPDH, even if the mass of the black holes has changed, either through evaporation or through accretion. Um, I won't do that, I don't really need to do that, but just to warn you, sometimes there are plots where FPDH goes to the left of the decayed ones, and then really, rho PDH is left decayed to nothing, and of course rho PDH today is zero, but nonetheless you can use this as a definition to find a non-zero value. So just, just warning you, you know, when you look at constraint plots, that's why this a constraint on FPVH might go to the left of 10 to the 15 or so grams. Um, now, loosely speaking, when you want to constrain the ones still surviving today, the best constraints come from their gravitational interactions. So this constraint is normally through gravity. After all, remember, how do we know there is dark matter? It's only through gravitational interactions. Okay. On the other hand, if you want to constrain the decayed ones, the evaporated ones, or the ones which are evaporating today, then the gravitational impact of these very light primordial black holes is essentially zero, and the best constraints come from looking for signatures from especially gamma rays emitted by the radiation. And so this is normally used for evaporating, which means we're looking for gamma rays and basically evaporation products. Okay. Uh, this is very loose. There are many, many, many different constraints, but roughly speaking, if you're looking at the gravitational interaction 
you're constraining FPVH, if you're looking at evaporation products, you're looking at beta. But they're always related in this way. Okay. So let's let's have a look at both of them. And I'm going to start with the dark matter connection. So I'm going to start with looking at gravitational um, constraints. So I'm going to start with um, microlensing. And indeed, this is not something I'm an expert in, so I'm not going to go into great details. Uh, but the basic idea is that you have some background star, you've got your telescope over here, and you're looking for any sign of an enhancement in the light of the background star as the primordial black hole crosses between you and the line of sight towards that star. Now, you'll only get a strong signal, a strong amount of gravitational lensing. Okay, so, so gravitational lensing, the signal is large if, basically, if large light mass, or if it passes extremely close to the line of sight. So line of sight. And what happens is that because of course dark matter is on the move and everything you know, is moving around each other, uh, you will get a time-dependent gravitational signal. Um, how quickly it varies up and down depends on the mass of the object. I'll, I'll give it a few examples. Um, but the time dependence is really key. It's very, very important because you're looking at individual stars and you don't know the intrinsic luminosity of those stars. So the way a survey works is it basically stares for a long time or at regular intervals at the same patch of the sky. For example, the large Magellanic clouds, it needs to be able to resolve the stars and it compares um, photographs, the luminosity of those stars, time and time again. Now, some of those stars are variable luminosity so they have to look to fit a particular light curve of how the light increases and decreases. And I'll give just a very rough sketch of what can happen. So as a function of time, um, linear time, is a, a luminosity enhancement. Sorry, enhancement. It's probably a bit hard to read. So no enhancement means the fraction is 1. And in principle, for a very extreme case where the primordial black hole goes very, very close to that, um, directly past the line of sight, this can be a factor of order 100. Okay. So a star can become magnified by about a factor of 100. Um, and what happens is so there's some gradual increase, then it becomes very bright. And it goes back and fades. That's if it passes very close. Uh, most of the time, you know, primordial black holes are tiny things. Um, it won't pass quite so close, and so you'll see a much weaker enhancement by a factor of order a few, and back down again. Um, yeah. well, this is close. Uh, optimistic case. Um, but stars can themselves vary in luminosity by a lot, so you know this is not an easy thing to look for. And something important now is what is the time scale? How long does it take for the luminosity to increase and decrease again? Because your survey will have to look regularly enough to see this transition. If you don't see several data points, then you can't trust it was a lensing signal as opposed to one of the many other complicated things which happens in astrophysics. So, So the time scale, it's going to be shorter for lighter objects, both because they may be moving more quickly, but more importantly, because the signal is only measurable 
when it's very close to the center of the line of salaries. So once it's moved a little bit away, the signal goes away. So the time scale can be hours for the sort of light end of what can be seen, potentially seen with microlensing, or something like 10 to the minus 6 solar mass object. Um, and it can be months for something like a 10 solar mass object. Okay. 10 solar mass objects, it takes a long time for the light to get brighter and fainter again. They have a much lighter Einstein uh, radius, whereas a very small object will come and go much more quickly. And of course, the total signal will be much smaller for the light one. Um, now, the historical surveys, um, so the, let me put in quotation marks, the old surveys, and there have been many, uh, Macho, Ogle, Eros, and uh, many more. They basically looked at a cadence, meaning repeating an observation on a every night basis. So a sort of 24 hour repeat, repetition. Always looking at the same patch of the sky and continuing for a order a year or so. So they were most sensitive to, well, things bigger than 10 to the minus 6 and less than about 10 solar masses. So these things probed, roughly speaking, 10 to the minus 6 to 10 solar. And they did see a few gravitational lensing events, but the problem with this is they're really just looking for any old compact object. It could be a free floating planet, um, potentially a brown dwarf, a neutron star. So, whilst these are good for finding upper bounds, and the upper bounds they found showed that you probably can't have all the dark matter in primordial black holes because they would have expected to see more microlensing than they really did. Um, it's very hard to turn these into a detection of something definitive because it's, it's agnostic about the, what the source is as long as it's reasonably compact. Yeah. But what I'm going to do is start on this board making a plot of constraints and I'll come back to this board as I discuss more constraints. So, terrible line to start. So here we've got M D H. So this is the classic way to plot it. You've got mass uh, log on a log scale and F D H also on a log scale. So once again, you've got one is, of course, a special value, that means all the dark matter. So we have this constraint without any observations. We simply know there's not more primordial black holes than there is dark matter. Um, so these old microlensing surveys, they went from about something like 10 to the minus 6, up to a border 1, between 1 and 10. And they reach about yeah, 0 0.1. Something like this. This is the old micro lensing. All of them, all of the old micro lensing surveys put together. And as I said, there are some. Some, a few events detected, but it's unclear what they are. And so the constraints are made assuming none of those events are primordial black holes. If you take the reverse, then you will you basically be claiming a detection slightly above this line, but not much above, certainly not at the edge of this one. Now there's been a new, a new constraint, which changed things a lot. 
which was the, I won't write it down in full, but the hyper subprime, suprime can on the Subaru telescope, HSC. And this just looked for one night, but it looked basically nonstop at the same patch of the sky with a very, very fine uh, resolution. So it could really resolve lots and lots of stars. And by looking almost continuously, it could probe much, much lighter scales because it could probe much, much shorter microlensing events. Things which would take minutes rather than hours. Um, so this probe, this was short and fast and sensitive. If I remember right, this was a 2018. And this took a big bite out of FPDH equals one. There's a little bit of an overlap. Um, but the peak constraint, oh, peak constraints around 10 to the minus 2, um, and it goes up again, peak constraints around 10 to the minus 9, and the constraint stops at 10 to the minus 12 solar masses. Okay, this is probably hard to read, I'll read out. So this is HSC, hyper subprime cam. He gets a peak constraint of about FPDH of 1% being about 10 to the minus 9 solar mass objects. Now originally, this was plotted up, actually it actually goes a bit better, almost all the way to 10 to the minus 12. And originally people thought it might even go further, and if you look at the papers by this collaboration, originally they went down to about 10 to the minus 15. However, that wasn't correct. So there's a lower bound on which mass they can probe, and that's due to what's called the finite source effect, which is basically, although stars are tiny, they look like just point sources, in reality, of course, a star has a certain size. And this um, finite source, this kicks in when the apparent size of the star on the sky is comparable to the apparent size of, again on the sky, of your lensing object, which is, in this case is incredibly tiny. Remember for the sun, if you shrunk the sun into a frame window into a black hole, it would have a radius of three kilometers. So down here you're thinking of 10 to the minus 12 kilometer short shield radius. This is a very tiny object looking at a star. And so when you've got a finite source effect, meaning that your star doesn't look tiny compared to the size of the lens, and then the lens can only lens light on some fraction of the surface of the star, not all of the surface of the star at the same time. And then the magnification becomes very small. So this limits um, M must be greater than about 10 to the minus 12. And that's very hard to get past this, this sort of lower limit for microlensing. In principle, you could look at stars further away, um, but you still have to be able to resolve the individual stars and the individual stellar luminosity and compare them as a function of time. So, you know, we, we might get another order of magnitude, but it's never going to go right down to the evaporation constraint of uh, 10 to the minus 18 solar masses. Now, when we think of going in the, towards the heavier end, now let's think of more than solar mass, heavier than solar mass objects. There are two things one can look at. So, Accretion is one. And accretion, it's very difficult. That would be my summary. It's very nonlinear. So the idea of accretion is that gas and, and baryons, oh, gas is made of baryons get gravitationally attracted towards the black hole 
and it starts spinning around it and starts spinning in and as it gets accelerated very very rapidly or strongly towards the event horizon this can radiate out high energy particles, high energy um, gamma rays and create a bright signal. Sorry, uh, yeah. may I ask a question? <clears throat> So I understand why there's a lower limit for the mass that um, microlensing can detect, but why there's an upper limit on the mass that they can detect? Uh, it's basically a matter of, I think there are two things. One is a matter of patience. For a very heavy object, it's going to take a very long time for it to fully pass in front of the line of sight of the star and oh, stop okay. having a gravitational effect. So. This, this sort of afterburn is getting towards many months. I see, okay. Um, and the other problem is simply one of number density. If you think FPBH equals constant, what does that mean for the number density? Well, FPBH is an energy density, so that's the mass times the number density. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you're looking for heavier and heavier objects, even when FPBH equals one, the number density is becoming small. So the probability that a heavy object will pass the line of sight becomes very small when there's very few of them. Ah, Even okay. if FPBH is still one. I see, okay. So yeah, it's, it's very challenging. You need to look at really lots of stars over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. thank you. But yeah, no problem. But yeah, it's good to get you know, some intuition of where the lower end is finite source and the upper end is sort of patience and just not many of these objects. Um, whereas at least the good thing about 10 to the minus 9 solar mass from wood of black holes is that there will be a lot of them. Yeah. There will be a lot of them within our, our galaxy, for example. Um, okay, but so accretion, well, this is the high, just it's very, very nonlinear, um, but it should give a bright signal and I'm sure you've all seen the photos of the Event Horizon Telescope which does see gas being accreted into a supermassive black hole. And the general consensus is that accretion, this is only important, meaning it will only create a large and bright signal if n is greater than somewhere between 1 and 10 solar masses. And then for much heavier objects, it becomes very large, very strong effect. And this could best be seen either today, for example, in, in our galaxy, um, but once again, the caveat with seeing the accretion onto a black hole today is how on earth do you know where the black hole came from? Why shouldn't it just be astrophysical? Um, and in this, this sort of mass range, it can be astrophysical. So the, the alternative would be to see the effect of accretion of accelerating and creating energy at the time of recombination. So, or the CMB formation, which is when we have recombination. And the detection of accretion onto a, primordial, onto a black hole at recombination would, of course, mean it's primordial. Accretion today doesn't mean that. So for today, you can really only use this as constraints. For this, you could potentially use this as a detection. Um, now, these constraints have changed by orders of magnitude over time, as people have revisited assumptions, looked for mistakes, looked for unrealistic assumptions, for example, spherical symmetry. Accretion does not appear to be spherically symmetric. So these are not very robust, or at least historically, were not very robust. But, but nonetheless, let me just sketch what would be seen as a reasonable estimate is that somewhere around 10, the constraint starts to get quite tight. And by the time you're at 100 or 1,000, the constraint is less than sort of 10 to the minus 4. Yeah. Okay. Because if you had 10 to the 4 solar mass primordial black holes, you'd expect to see a strong signature already at the time when the CMB formed, and that hasn't been seen. 
So you don't need very many of them. Then the last, towards the heavy end, um, of the, again, of the old constraints, accretion has been studied for decades. The last I'll mention is sometimes called dynamical or uh, discreteness effects. What do I mean by this? Well, we see a dark matter halo around every galaxy we can probe. We see the um, yeah, the velocity rotation curves, which have been seen right back in the 1960s by Rubin and then, you know, for another 60 years now. And if the primordial black holes were extremely massive, for example, getting towards the comparable mass to a dwarf galaxy, which can be as light as about 10 to the 7 solar masses, you wouldn't, you, basically, you would destroy them, or at the very least, you couldn't model the dark matter as a as an effective fluid on the scale of the galaxy. However, these constraints, I'm not going to talk more about them because they're always weaker. So this one was accretion, and now if you are dynamical, they do something rather similar, but they're weaker. So you know, that they are important, and actually, some people want these dynamical constraints rather as a detection on the basis that there are certain issues, for example, the cusp versus core problem of what happens towards the center of galaxies. Uh, should the dark matter be cuspy towards the center? Well, none of it's uh, made out of discrete objects. Uh, effectively, there's a shock noise associated with them, which doesn't allow the dark matter the density field to become too large in the center of halos. Uh, but most, you know, it's still open for debate, but I would think it's fair to say that most people would say that's probably due to baryonic effects rather than dark matter effects, and that we might be being fooled by dark matter simulations. The other question? Okay, there was a little background noise. Okay, so dynamical, uh, but don't need to say very much about these. Just that, you know, astrophysics would be different if you had gravitational sources with masses bigger than about 10 or so solar masses. And in principle, there should be some signature, but it's hard to probe when astrophysics itself is so nonlinear and difficult to model. Um, so, let me talk then about a third constraint relevant for non evaporated, sorry, a fourth microlensing accretion dynamical, a fourth constraint for the non uh, evaporated ones are gravitational waves. And this is a new the new one, for many people, the most exciting. Which have gravitational waves. And this is using the LIGO, of course, LIGO Virgo observations. And as you all know, right, they've detected multiple mergers. Once again, though, as we discussed on Wednesday, very hard to know if it's detected primordial or astrophysical black holes, because once the black hole is formed, it doesn't tell you there's no way to know what it was made out of. Uh, or there's no direct way at least. And we only see mergers at essentially redshift very close to zero. So we, we're not probing the high redshift universe, at least not. Not in the next decade or so. Um, so these detectors, they're most sensitive um, to a specific frequency, which is to do with uh, the arm length of the detector, um, which corresponds to about, well, 10 to 
10 to the 2 solar mass. Okay. And in this range, where they're most sensitive, they can constrain FKBH less than about 10 to the minus 3. And if you instead treat the events from LIGO Verbo as being in detection of only primordial black holes, then you can ask, well, which value of FPVH will give me the correct merger rate to match how often LIGO and Virgo see something happen? Okay. And then the answer is it's a bit bigger than this. FPVH should be about 3 times 10 to the minus 3. for detection. And then the central mass needs to be around 20 solar masses. But of course I'm not claiming a detection because we don't know these events are primordial. And in fact, and again I presented on Wednesday, a uh, Bayesian model comparison I was involved with, with Alex Oil and Andrew Gao, where we showed it strongly disfavored that all of the events would be primordial. The mixed scenario is allowed, but not all of them. So, what I can say is some, but not all. And in that case, this value of FP of VH doesn't change dramatically, it changes maybe 2 times 10 to the minus 3. So, you know, it may, it has seen events by now about, I think, of order 50 events. So that's of order 100 compact objects. Um, but they can't all be due to primordial black holes. Um, now, the calculation, and it's quite tricky, but the, the basic idea of how do you go from FPVH and a mass function to a merger rate today, well, the idea is you assume. Well, you don't assume, you can calculate how rapidly and how many of the initial primordial black holes form binary pairs in the early universe. So this is based on early binaries. By early, I mean binaries which formed from before matter radiation equality. And once they form a binary pair, the distance between them is not very large. Remember, the early universe is not very large. And they circle around each other, and it can easily take 10, 20, or 100 even billion years for that binary pair to merge. Because the only way really they lose energy is through gravitational radiation, which when they're relatively far apart, is a very weak effect. You know, gravitational waves are very, very weak except when you are very close to the merge of the final second. Okay. So the big question here is disruption. You know, that's the big hidden assumption. Does a black hole, black hole, binary pair, which was present before matter radiation equality, survive until the present day, just, you know, in a lonely existence, circling each other into a bang? Or will a third primordial black hole or some other object come along and disrupt? Um, and as you can probably imagine, that's a difficult numerical problem to try and solve. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work. There's been a group in Estonia, um, Marty Regel, there's uh, Kassim Jadamzik, uh, as well with I've run numerous simulations. And the answer seems to be there's a, in terms of disruption, no. If FPVH is less than about 0 0.1. So if if all the dark matter is in primordial black holes around the LIGO mass, 10 ish solar masses then disruption becomes common, very common. Perhaps even 99.999% of them will be disrupted, 
But that doesn't mean the merger rate itself is disrupted by that huge amount, because when you disrupt a pair, you often form a new binary pair. Uh, but with different properties, with a different uh, semi-major axis, with a different ellipticity, and then you have to try and calculate what the merge rate is of late-time binary pairs. And, you know, that's all very complicated. There's not a complete consensus, but given that there are other constraints ruling out FPDH, order one on those scales, it seems like you can't have all the dark matter in LIGO sort of match with the black holes. And you're left with the constraints more like FPDH less than about 10 to the minus 3. And let me try to draw it. So the constraint starts actually quite a bit lighter, around um, 10 to the minus 2-ish. Okay. Um, by the way, this plot I showed on Wednesday, it's in the Wednesday uh, lecture notes, comes down to about 10 to the minus oops, and the minus three at about 10 solar mass, and then it goes quite sharply back up again. Because once you're past, much past 100 solar mass objects, um, the merger takes place in a frequency band which Lego and Virgo are not sensitive to. So this one here is gravitational waves. And this is really very new. This is from the last few years only. So you can see a big chunk is being eaten out. If you really are interested in FPDH equals 1, you're forced to move to the left-hand side. You're forced to move all the way over here till down to about 10 to the minus 18. And why is that? Well, let me just give the numbers, so activity of chip was one window. You require um, Okay, so what is this window? It's between about 10 to the 17, 10, this is in grams, 22 grams, or 10 to the minus 16, up to about 10 to the minus 12 solar masses. So this upper bound is where the microlensing constraints go away because of the finite source effect, basically because stars are individually too large, as far as they used to imagine, on the sky, to see an effectively large, see a larger gravitational lensing signal. Um, and this range is very, very hard to probe. There have been attempts, they've all died. I showed an example of one which died in six days about the Kuiper belt. There have been others about the destruction of neutron stars or white dwarfs by these light objects, which occasionally could fall into one. But again, these are all very non-linear problems to model, and they've always, in the end, been withdrawn or sort of shown to be at the best optimistic. Um, so this is the remaining window. Now, that doesn't mean it's not of interest anywhere else. Of course, that's not true, because, you know, well, what is 1% of the dark matter? Nobody knows. What is thousands of the dark matter nobody knows so you know anywhere along here you can still have a mixed model and even over here you can probe for example what is the seed of supermassive black holes getting to very heavy ions so i think we shouldn't we shouldn't give up in being interested on mass ranges where only a small fraction of the dark matter can be of primordial black holes you know, the detection of just one rabbit from the very early universe, long before Big Bang nuclear synthesis, would be an incredible thing. And you know, that I wouldn't be less excited by knowing there was a primordial black hole here than I would, would be to know that all of the dark matter of primordial black holes over here. But that's a matter of taste. Some people are quite fixated on FPDH equals one as being the interesting opportunity and everything else being a waste of time. But I really don't see it that way at all. <laughs>
Yeah, are there any questions about this heavy end of the constraints before I start talking about evaporation? I have a question about this plot. Mm -hmm. um, so I would expect that uh, if we have primordial black holes as dark matter, then on this mass spectrum, they each mass would contribute a fraction. So let's say 10 to the minus 18 would be, I don't know, 10 to the minus 3. And yeah, so every mass contrib contributes a fraction and not one particular mass contributes one. I think that's a very extreme case. So why it, it's not, in my opinion, it's not sensible to think about this. Okay. Um, so you're right that this plot is assuming a monochromatic mass spectrum. Which I, I agree, it's not realistic. Um, why it's done is mainly for simplicity. Uh, however, people have done a fair bit of work on looking at what happens beyond um, monochromatic constraints. Uh, group in Barcelona with Nicola Payoma, Lichabed, etc. For example, looked at how do you translate these constraints for a broader mass function? And the answer is the constraints, they shift around left and right, they shift up and down, but they only shift by a factor of a few, never by an order of magnitude. So although, you know, if you want to look at an actual value, you can't just look at this and see what it would be for a broader mass function. You definitely can't integrate like over here and this, and guess that FPDH will be one when you integrate between say, 10 to the minus two and one. That simply doesn't work at all. Um, these constraints come from basically seeing not no or almost no uh, lensing events at all over any mass. So you can't think that, well, if I didn't see any here, I'm allowed to have a few more over here. But it's, this is really a constraint on all of these scales put together. So, you know, I agree totally that monochromatic is not sensible, but equally the constraints yeah, they are quite close to what you would get, even for something like a log normal mass function. Okay, thanks. That, that's very interesting that it's mm -hmm. not so sensitive on if it's monochromatic or not. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, it's very non-trivial. Okay. Uh, of course, if one wants to do a non-monochromatic, one has to look at what the ex experiment actually detects. And there's no sort of one rule which will apply for microlensing or for gravitational waves or for accretion. You have to do it differently on a case by case basis, but it never changes by an order of magnitude. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else? No? No, um, oh well, I'll just briefly say right here there's a very large mass window. So here you can fit any mass function you want, which integrates to FPVH equals one. And that's all the dark matter. There's no reason why it should be only one of these masses, but it doesn't matter how you distribute it within this window. Okay, but then I'm going to move on to evaporation constraints, and then I think we'll, we'll stop for a break. So, you know, why? I'm now going to discuss why did this lower bound come 10 to the minus 16 solar masses or 10 to the 17 grams? So, what does this evaporation, where does this come from? Well, of course, it's to, from Hawking uh, radiation who showed uh, that, I think this was in the 70s, that there is a temperature associated with a black hole horizon. And the temperature, walking temperature, is inversely proportional to the mass. Um, and for something like the solar mass, or for any astrophysical black hole, this temperature is incredibly close to zero. It's much, much colder than the cosmic microwave background temperature. So any astrophysical black hole, for all practical purposes, you can neglect the Hawking evaporation completely 
And in fact, it's actually accreting background photons because it's colder than the background universe. But let's look at what the consequences of Hawking evaporation. I give the formula, I don't, I don't justify it. But let's use that and to see what the consequences are. Okay. So well, what we want to know now is how much energy is a black hole radiating away? To know how much it's radiating, well, we need to know something about the, the surface area of the black hole. And the surface area is, of course, proportional to the radius squared. This is proportional to the shark shell radius squared. Okay. And if you remember, the shark shell radius of the black hole is linearly proportional to the mass. That's also quite non trivial, but it is linearly proportional to the mass. So this thing is proportional to the mass squared. Okay. The area of a black hole is proportional to its mass bit. I'm dropping the subscript MPVH because it's just too messy to keep writing everywhere. Um, now, the evaporation products follow a black body spectrum with this temperature, this temperature here. Okay. So when you have a black body, um, the energy radiated, and I'm sure most of you will have seen this from a thermodynamics course, the energy radiated is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power per unit area. So per unit area. And, okay. This is just thermodynamic arguments here. So what's the total radiation? Well, total radiation is proportional to the area, okay, because every unit area is evaporating, and temperature to the fourth power. To the four. So we know the area is proportional to the mass squared, the temperature is inversely proportional to the mass, so the total evaporation, the total energy loss is proportional m to the minus two. So that's why we don't see any radiation from heavy black holes. The mass is large, and if you put in the correct units, you'll see that energy being radiated is completely negligible. However, as you go to light masses, this quickly becomes much, much larger as you go to the very light end. So now let's think about the energy loss. Remember, E equals mc squared in unit C equals 1. But E is equal to M. So the energy loss, dm by dt, which is energy loss, this is proportional to 1 over m squared. So without needing to know any of the constants of proportionality, we know that the integral of m squared, flipping this up, dm. Proportional to the integral of dt. Yeah. Okay, so this is m cubed, is proportional to t. So the lifetime of a black hole is proportional to the cube of the initial mass. And that's the important result. Okay. So m initial cubed. And that's a very simple derivation I've shown, starting from the Hawking temperature of the horizon being inversely proportional to the mass. And now the obvious question to ask, well, is to plug in all the numerical constants, and I didn't do that because it would take me too long, and plus I don't think it's a particularly instructive to just see me probably making mistakes on the blackboard trying to Get all the factors right, and 
But if you do that, if you then ask for T evaporation equals T zero, remember zero for the H for the today, so if you make the H equal to 14 billion years, you'll find that this implies the mass of the black hole, initial mass, was of order 10 to the 15 grams. Um, now this is, you know, not much. This is 10 to the minus 18 solar masses. Um, but those which are a bit heavier, up to about 10 to the 17 grams, black hole again initial, if that was less than about 10 to the 17 grams, we would be able to see some of the evaporation signal today, even though the evaporation would still be quite weak. Remember, the energy loss goes like 1 over m squared. If it's 10 to the 16 grams, then the energy loss is two orders of magnitude larger. If it's 10 to the 15 grams, it's starting to become almost infinite. And before, of course, it's all gone away. So the constraint on the lichen starts around 10 to the minus 18, and it gets very rapidly tighter. It's almost a straight line on this plot. This one is evaporation. And this is the dark matter window. The lower bound is from the ones where we should see some evaporation signals, some gamma rays coming from the thing today. The right hand side is from the finite source effect. In this space, by quite a few orders of magnitude, is very hard to probe. So, um, well, I guess before I stop for the break, it's still worth saying that, okay, these are best constrained if they evaporate today. For 10 to the 15 grams. But even much lighter primordial black holes um, could be seen, such as uh, something of order 10 to the 10 grams would be evaporating at the time of Big Bang nuclear synthesis. Okay. So if M, again initial, is 10 to the 10 grams, then T evaporation is about a minute. And this is also very well constrained because if you had Hawking radiation uh, creating very high energy gamma rays during the time of Big Bang nuclear synthesis, this would change the primordial, primordial abundance of hydrogen and helium. So, you know, this is also very tightly constrained, but there is a possibility um, if you go even lighter. So even lower masses, then there's basically no constraint, almost no constraint. Um, and what's exciting about that, you might think, well, you know, who cares? Of course it's, you know, it would be interesting to know that the universe, early universe, was filled with primordial black holes. But if they all evaporated to nothing, then before the earliest epoch we can semi-directly probe that big bang nuclear synthesis, then you might wonder, well, why does it matter? And the answer is, well, as we saw, okay, the evaporation, the the m by dt is proportional to 1 over m squared. So what happens when the mass becomes a void of the Planck mass? then the energy evaporated becomes Planckian, and then the laws of physics break down, the, the length scale becomes a void of Planck length, the Schwarzschild radius. So Schwarzschild is approximately L Planck, and then we go down. So maybe this breaks down at the Planck scale, and maybe it ends. So could we have Planck mass radix? 
And well, a derelict form, we don't know. Uh, one potential argument in favor of relics is the idea that they solve the information paradox. Okay, because it's just a hypothesis, but maybe information should be conserved. Some people think on a sort of philosophical level that's a very good thing. Well, when uh, things fall into a black hole, uh, as I said, there's no memory left of what the black hole was made out of. Hawking evaporation, the Hawking temperature doesn't care at all about the contents which fell in to make that black hole. So where does the information go? Well, either it's destroyed or it's invisible to us, but it survives in a Planck mass wreck. That sounds quite exotic, but some people take that seriously. Um, so this is the other FPBH equals one candidate would be, you know, it's a possible, but a theoretical dark matter candidate. And it's probably a nightmare scenario in the sense of how on earth do we know if all the primordial black holes decayed down to our relic before the time of BBN, how are we going to know? Now there was, and I showed this at one Wednesday, just uh, flashed up a paper, a very recent one, claiming that as they evaporate, um, once they get down to very light masses towards the Planck mass, then the evaporation will give them a big kick because it's not completely isotropic, it's statistically isotropic, but not specifically isotropic. So the final few particles which can evaporate might give it a big pick, kick, give it a good peculiar velocity, and hence make it warm rather than the cold dark matter. And so, you know, it's a possible dark matter candidate. It might have been already ruled out. So maybe it's actually ruled out on theoretical grounds. Um, or maybe it can never be ruled out because it's just too hard to take or maybe impossible. And you know, I wasn't watching the lectures by Narakovi, but uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the dark matter candidates fall in this category where it's not clear we can ever detect them. If we see what the dark matter is, then we can maybe learn what it isn't by a process of elimination. But if we don't find it, I think there'll be lots and lots of surviving candidates, of which relics might be one of them, where there's simply no guaranteed way to, to be able to find them. Um, which is a bit depressing, but that's, you know, Physics doesn't have to share all its secrets with us, and yeah, time will tell if we find it or not. But I think if you just randomly pick some dark matter model and pick some part of the parameter space, the chance that there's an experiment in the next 10 or even 100 years which can probe that part of the parameter space is probably small. Yeah. So on that happy note, I think uh, I'd like to take a break. Um, Unless there are questions beforehand. Well, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, can the detection of the stochastic Gaussian wave uh, play some constraint on FPVH? Absolutely. Um, I'll come to that after the break. So I won't answer you now, but yes. OK, thanks. A good question. Can I make another quick question? Sure. So in the constraints plot for the evaporation constraint, I mean, the FPVH that we saw is not really the, the physical fraction, right? Because, I mean, they would have evaporated today. Is correct. that right? That's absolutely correct. So I, yeah, as I said at the beginning, when we were on the very left-hand side, this FPVH is not really FPVH. It's it's equal to the ratio a um, a quality of a formation times beta. Okay, so it's really a constraint on beta, but with another normalization. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank because you. Because once it's all evaporated, of course, FPVH is really zero. I see. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're right. 
but sometimes people use it. They normally use it though only a little bit on the left hand side and then they stop. They don't plot the masses which decay up, say big bang matrix synthesis. Then they normally make a plot of beta instead. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I also have a quick question. Um, the assumption that we should have observed uh, the, the Hawking uh, radiation, uh, for instance, during MIBN, is, is the, assuming that it's a, well, a, a standard model interaction, or you just assuming that it's radiation? Um, I think it assumes that it evaporates somehow equally into all light like, particles, including photons. Okay. Um, but which seems normal for a black body spectrum. But if it radiated into, let's say if you have lots of hidden sectors, which it can radiate into, then I think the constraints could change, yes. If that's what you had in mind. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's right, yeah. If there was like dark radiation, for example, then I guess that wouldn't interact and it wouldn't, yeah. That's a good point. I don't know if anyone's actually explicitly explored this sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's a hand up. Hi. Hi. Um, Maybe one very naive question about this. Are there any um, similar bounds on the abundance of primordial black holes because of the, um, because they would catalyze vacuum instability in their, in their surrounding? There are. Um, they're controversial because it's not clear if you can catalyze an instability or not. But yes, there are. And um, there was a group in Newcastle or Durham, um, including Ruth Gregory, who looked at this, amongst other people. Um, oh, I think Ian Moss as well and others. Um, and yet, this, this was the idea that the Higgs potential can become unstable when you do renormalization group flow to very high energies. And potentially, you can reach these high energies when, you know, as the mass goes to zero, you do reach very high energies. Uh, so yes, I've looked into that. I actually looked into that with Pippa, not, not to understand how serious this problem was, but just to ask, well, in principle, the best possible constraint is that you're not allowed a single evaporation because that would destroy the whole universe. So we looked at what that would do for constraints in FPBH. Um, so yeah, no, it's not a naive question. It's good, but, uh, but of course, you know, we know the universe hasn't been destroyed. We, I'm not sure we can ever know that it could in principle be destroyed then. I wouldn't like to test it. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess that, that's the way that that's what how you would obtain a, maybe a, a constraint on it because exactly it hasn't uh, decayed. Maybe it has to if this was a possibility, this catalyzation process, then maybe you can say we cannot have too many of them because they would over catalyze. I think that's their mentality of Gregory and the most. Mm -hmm. But again, I haven't look, I haven't looked at this uh, myself in detail, so yeah, I can't say more than that. Okay, no, good thanks. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, the extreme is that a single catalyzation would destroy the whole universe. We took that, but um, I'm not sure I should take it super seriously. But it, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, maybe it's time then for a 10 minute coffee break. Um, I think I'll finish on time, so how about that? Come back at quarter past. Does that sound good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, sure. Good to remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we're nearly, nearly finished. I'm now going to just talk about how do we take these constraints plus the constraints on the left, uh, turn these into constraints on the primordial power spectrum. Well, 
for FPBH and for beta, we've already seen the relation, the logarithmic relation. So we know that a large, many orders of magnitude change in FPBH gives only a small change in the required amplitude of the primordial power spectrum. So let me just talk now more generally about the initial conditions, not on the large scales, the cosmic microwave background scales, but smaller scales. So I'm going to talk briefly about probing small scale uh, perturbations. And really, we have three things we've got. Primordial black holes, of course, um, what this course was above. Okay. And I already showed this on uh, yes, yesterday, in fact, and that the amplitude would have to be around 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 2 for the power spectrum in order to generate any primordial black holes. So another one is uh, spectral distortions. Again, not such a widely studied topic. These haven't been detected. But uh, basically, the idea is that the early universe was in thermal equilibrium. Okay? Thermal equilibrium between everything, not just the radiation in thermal equilibrium and the uh, baryons, mainly the electrons are important in thermal equilibrium, but thermal equilibrium between the photons and the electrons because everything was tightly coupled. So the idea is thermal equilibrium uh, implies a black body spectrum. And this thermal equilibrium is essentially perfect when you've got a homogeneous and isotropic universe and sufficiently high energies that you have frequent interactions, frequently meaning many interactions per Hubble time between photons and electrons and electrons and baryons. So everything's in thermal equilibrium. And so when you have a black body spectrum, well, that's why the cosmic microwave background is observed to obey a black body spectrum. Although there are temperature perturbations, individually, the, um, in different directions, even when it's very hot or very cold, well, relatively speaking, very hot or very cold compared to the average CMB temperature, it still follows the black body um, spectrum. Okay, so then. So the CMB is more or less the perfect black body. And indeed, uh, for those who don't know a bit about the history of cosmology, when the cosmic microwave black band was discovered, there was no consensus on what it implied. And today it's taught as being obvious that this is the leftover heat from the Big Bang. But well, when it was first detected, it wasn't known that it was a black body, it was simply known that there was an excess of uh, microwave photons, which seemed to be independent of where you pointed your telescope across the sky. I guess it's back in uh, the 60s, if I remember right. Okay. And it was only much, much later in the 90s that the Kobe virus virus instrument, which effectively flew a black body in space, the black body temperature was chosen to be equal to the CMB black body temperature, and then, then sort of compared them, and well, the CMB was the better black body. So this thing showed it's, you know, very, very close to black body. This one sort of demonstrated this nearly perfect black body spectrum. Um, now, however, the early universe, of course, didn't stay in thermal equilibrium forever, and there are certain things which could have shaken the perfect black bodiness, and one of which is uh, energy injection into the plasma, the baryon photon uh, plasma, at certain energy scales. If you inject extra energy, you wouldn't no longer be able to re reach thermal equilibrium. 
So the idea is that an energy injection could mildly break um, thermal equilibrium. And there are many potential ways to have inject energy. One would be uh, decaying dark matter. It, it decayed quite early in the history of the universe, um, annihilating dark matter, um, evaporating primordial black holes. But a much simpler one is simply the, the fact that you've got oscillations, you've got a, you know, it's not a perfectly smooth background. So again, if the perturbations are a bit larger, they'll be sort of sloshing around and bouncing in and out, and this will diffuse energy. So one example of energy injection is uh, energy diffusion of perturbations. So, as with so much of cosmology, we haven't detected this, we haven't seen any deviation from a black body, and by the way, although the COBE satellite looked for this, the subsequent satellites, WMAP and Planck, they didn't look for any deviation again. They just went with the COBE result, and they, they looked for temperature differences. So they measured differences in temperature, but not absolute temperatures. So they couldn't detect whether or they could improve the constraint on just how precisely the CMB follows a black body. So when you plug things in, this finds a constraint that the power spectrum amplitude should be less than about 10 to the minus 4. Again, this is from the 90s, so it could be improved with new technology. Um, on a range of scales, k uh, between about 1 and about 10 to the 4, Inverse megaparsec. Okay. So remembering that smaller scales correspond to lower masses, this is going to rule out primordial black holes on this range of scales because this amplitude of 10 to the minus 4 is far too small to, to generate primordial black holes. Um, we need about 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3, so a fair bit larger than this. So this can rule out PBH production. And above this sort of mass, the... Okay, this is a length scale. I gave you a relation between K and horizon mass, which gives you roughly the black hole mass and the tensor. This mass is about, uh, so m should be less than about 10 to the 4 solar masses for a primordial black hole. There is a big caveat though. This amplitude is assuming Gaussian perturbations. The amplitude required to generate primordial black holes was also assuming Gaussian perturbations and an early radiation dominated era. Okay, so that's the main caveat. So again, I'm assuming Gaussianity. And remember, primordial black holes are very, very rare. We're talking about a fraction to collapse beta of 10 to the minus 10, typically, or less. So deep in the tail, non-Gaussianity can change things by quite a lot. So this is the main caveat. Um, but if you invoke non gaussianity you have to do it very carefully because it, a lot of things change. I mean, that goes well beyond this course, but you can't simply say, well, I've got non gaussianity so I can evade the spectral distortion constraint. You then have to redo all the calculations, and you don't necessarily succeed to evade what you wanted to evade. Um, so anyway, that's, so that's spectral distortions in a nutshell. Um, final one and look at uh, gravitational waves. Okay. So what's from gravitational waves got to do with this? Well, of course there are gravitational waves caused by black holes merging, 
but we can find a more model independent constraint in the power spectrum without having any prime order black holes, simply from the fact that at nonlinear order, scalar and vector perturbations do couple. Sorry, scalar and tensor also vector, in fact. So linear order, and this is what you'll do in a your cosmology course, probably. Linear order implies scalar. So scalar for our scale R and tensor, normally called H, little h, or Hij for gravitational waves, because we're talking about small perturbations to the metric decouple. But this was only at linear order. And at nonlinear order, things get a real mess. Solving nonlinear uh, perturbation equations, remembering that the Einstein equations themselves are nonlinear, is very difficult. But it's possible, even analytically in some regimes and making some approximations. So, so the idea is that large, very large amplitude. Um, scalar perturbations perturbations okay will induce non-linear tensor perturbations and in fact you can ask uh, your host Nicola Laftalog has done a lot of work on, on this uh, more than me so these induce second order Tensors. And although it's a lot of work to do the calculation properly, uh, it's some rather fiendishly difficult um, second order couple of differential equations, we can make an estimate, in fact, quite straightforwardly. So the idea is so these second order perturbations, uh, this superscript 2 means I'm talking second order. So these are the second order tensors, H2. Um, they have a source term to their equation of motion, which is the square of the scalar, linear scalar perturbations. So the linear perturbation is squared. So these are different things. This is second order, this is first order squared. So let me just maybe write this. Really explicitly, the first order, and then the whole thing squared. Okay, at linear order, the linear uh, gravitational waves do not have any source term from the linear scalar perturbations, but at second order they do. But it's a second order source. So one can just estimate, and it turns out to be not too bad, that the amplitude of the tensor perturbations. Well, what's that going to be? It's going to be the second order tensor perturbation squared. Remember, the power spectrum is always the square of the perturbation. This thing will go like the scalar perturbation to the fourth power. Remember, the power spectrum goes like the scalar perturbation squared. So this whole thing goes like the amplitude of the scalar perturbation power spectrum squared. So we can see, hopefully, that you know, if the power spectrum is 10 to the minus 9, gravitational wave power spectrum is going to be something like 10 to the minus 18. And that's not terribly wrong. So for the tensor to scalar ratio, if it was generated by second order scalar perturbations on CMB scales where the perturbations are very small, these are tiny, 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 not observable. But when the power spectrum is of order 10 to the minus 2, okay, R is of order 0 0.1, then the tensor perturbations become quite large, and this could be seen potentially uh, as a stochastic background of gravitational waves. So this is a stochastic gravitational wave background. which at some level must exist, because there are non-zero scalar perturbations, but it will only be large 
over some narrow range of scales of frequencies, assuming you know that there was this peak in the primordial power spectrum which enhanced the amplitude enough to make this sort of thing observable. Um, so one would like to know the frequency, and that's not too difficult to do. The, so the frequency. Well, once again, what's going to set the frequency of these gravitational waves is going to be the horizon scale. So CK, um, my K is the relevant scale where the power spectrum is peaked, the scale which might form primordial black holes if the amplitude is large enough. Um, so this K, remember, is 1 over, is the C over uh, the wavelength lambda, roughly speaking, which is um, C times AH. This is at the time of horizon re entry. And just by coincidence, if you plug in the relationship between frequency and mass, um, MPBH approximately the solar mass, which remember also come, corresponds to the QCD scale. Corresponds to well, a temperature of about 200 MeV, happens to correspond to a frequency which the pulsar timing array could potentially detect the stochastic background of gravitational waves. Yeah, this is the right, so the frequency is seen for the pulsar timing array, and in particular, nanograv. Uh, which is a pulsar timing array experiment, which if I remember I had, um, I think it was 11 or 12 years of data, but they've got a few more years of data in the, in the pipeline that they just haven't processed and published yet. So nanograph have potentially seen a detection of some sort of stochastic background, but they can't really say it's a gravitational waves. They've simply seen some excess signal and they're working to interpret. And at the moment. So these are long running experiments. Um, if you look at what this sort of frequency corresponds to in terms of a time scale, it's about 10 years. So the, this is about a, a sort of a decade long experiment, which is still ongoing. Yeah. I don't have time to explain really what it does, but it looks at pulses across the sky. Pulses are very quite precise clocks. They spin very rapidly, um, many times per second. And the idea is if the gravitational wave shakes the Earth, then there will be a coherent shift in the timing residuals, so the difference in timing between us and the pulses, because we've moved, so the relative distance between us and the pulses has moved. And if we move to this side, then the distance to these pulses is shorter and the distance to those pulses over there is further. Yeah. So it's a really cool idea to try and observe you know, gravitational waves by looking, by timing pulses and looking at how, how regular those they are. And of course you need to use lots of them and they're using something like 50-ish pulses over a decade. Um, and yeah, I'm going to show a plot of what these constraints look like. I don't know. Use this board this because this is better quality than the next one. So last plot I'll draw. So here we've got a um, k in a megaparsec to the minus one. We're going to put an alternative mass scale along the top. This is m eh, and this, of course, is the power spectrum. Okay, the primordial power spectrum. And we know on scales larger than about the, the megaparsec, so one, the power spectrum was 2 times 10 to the minus 9. 
and very slightly red. And this is detection, and this is the only detection. Everywhere else we only have upper bounds. So then between here and about 10, 10 to the 4. So again, this is 10 to the 4 inverse megaparsec. So the physical scale is 1,000th of a megaparsec. This is where the mu distortion constraints are important. Then they are about 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 5. So they come from here. And they go up back here, and this mass scale here is about 10 to the 4, sorry, actually, units, I always moan at my students when they don't include units, so there we go, 10 to the 4 solar masses. So this is a mu distortion. This is with Kobe Firas. There are plans with something called Pixie or Prism to be able to push this constraint right down to 10 to the minus 9. So, to the point where you expect to see something even if the power spectrum continues to be nearly flat, right up to this 10 to the 4 inverse megaparsec scale. Okay, so then this, this line here is just my other vertical axis. Um, what I need now is the line of primordial black holes, so that goes from about 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2. It's weaker on the heavier masses, remember heavier masses have a larger value of theta. So it starts up here and it's nearly, but not quite scale invariant. So this is PBH. It's not exactly flat, there are improvements in constraints and some biases, weaknesses and others. And we can go up to something like about 10 to the 18 in gets megaparsec. So primordial black holes constrain more, a larger range of scales than everything else put together. Just not very tightly. Um, and remember, this constraint, I'll write it on PR, is proportional to delta critical squared over log 1 over beta. So that's why it's nearly flat, it only changes by a factor of few, it's because you're only logarithmically sensitive to the constraint on beta. The last thing then, uh, what about gravitational wave constraints? Well, they are, this is about one solar mass, they're somewhere around here. And by amazing coincidence, they're almost exactly as tight. Almost exactly where the QCD scale is, almost exactly where LIGO is. So here we have pulsar timing array through nanograv, and in fact also the European pulsar timing array. Okay. And it's at the point where, you know, if LIGO has seen any primordial black hole, the pulsar timing array should very shortly see a stochastic background of gravitational waves. So, you now th this is a hope here. We have a synergy of pulsar timing array plus the QCD plus LIGO, all arranging at the right mass scale, the right frequency scale, the right physical scale, and the right energy scale to give you three very interesting effects. In the future, there's going to be something else of great interest, which is here. Doesn't matter exactly where I show it, 10 to the minus 12, say 10 to the minus um, 18 or so. The LISA satellite, which is a European satellite, due to fly in mid 2030s, so it's still quite a long way away, but that will be very sensitive to a stochastic background of gravitational waves, something like this. Okay, this will be, this is futuristic. This is today, this is far future, 10, 20 years, LISA. But remember, this mass range was where all the asteroid mass sort of window, where FPBH could be equal to 1. So if all the dark matter are in asteroid mass primordial black holes, LISA is really should be guaranteed a very strong signal, that many, many sigma. So, you know, this is the good news. So, for the future, 
If we start with soon, we've got you know pulsar timing array plus LIGO Virgo. LIGO Virgo. This is all exciting now. Could happen whenever the next data release is that you know there could be a sub Chandra Saker. It could be a gravitational wave. Sorry, a stochastic gravitational wave detection. Either of these could be strong evidence towards primordial black holes. Going much further into the future, um, so more futuristic, but not unrealistic for experiments which will happen. You could see a merger at very high redshift, so a YZ merger. So there's a greater than about 15. Again, there shouldn't be any stars which have had time to form and collapse and you know, create a compact object, so that would be an indirect, but well, no, a fairly direct proof of a primordial black hole. And then there's this Lisa and asteroid mass syndrome. So we've also got Lisa plus asteroid mass. Where, as I said, this should really be a guaranteed detection. So I think, with the possible exception of relics, really the future looks quite bright. Um, I want to finish leaving you with this sort of plot. So yes, the power spectrum on these large scales, it's quite flat and featureless and small. But remember, if there was a new block of ultra-slow roll, if there was something like that, with just 2.3 eufolds of ultra-slow roll, your power spectrum could easily come up. It can go up very high. Depending on when your inflection point occurs, you can tune, basically tune it to be where you like. You can form different masses at different scales and potentially see a secondary signal through gravitational waves. So, you know, stay tuned. That would be my message, and it's bang on time to finish. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Of course, uh, uh, I uh, ask the students if they have uh, some further questions for you about the last, this last part of the lecture. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hi. If we measure some stochastic background or gravitational wave, how can we be sure that it's coming from that it's uh, that then it's an effect that would produce gravitational waves? Like, for example, there could be some sourced gravitational waves or uh, something else. Can we really be? Is there a way or a range of modes in which we can really be sure that, or there are no other models that can predict a stochastic background in a tree or? Okay, in fact, there are other models which can predict a stochastic background, such as phase transitions in the early universe, also at late times from mergers of black holes, or uh, for LISA, it will probably see a background of uh, supermassive black holes. Um, the hope, though, is that the, the frequency dependence, you know, if you have a relatively narrow peak in the primordial power spectrum, that gives a very distinctive shape of the frequency. And if you're seeing something at multiple sigma, so with the high signals to noise, um, the frequency is dependent certainly of the astrophysical sources is known. Well, we haven't seen it, but uh, the prediction is fairly clear that the frequency dependence is very different than that of a stochastic background from a large peak. Nice. So, but you're right, I mean, if it's so clear, then it's fine. If it's towards the edges, you know, then it becomes very difficult to separate different stochastic backgrounds. And so, yeah, we have to see how well the instrument really can perform. Yeah, but it makes sense that the frequency would be quite, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's the key. So, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question still about the uh, uh, gravitational waves. Uh, do they give any contribution to uh, an effective 
Um, I think it's very small. I'm too small to see. But honestly, I'm not totally sure, right? Does anyone else know? Uh, I don't think so. That's the best I can say. Okay. I mean, I don't think uh, an observable one, put it that way. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Or do you want to start the goodbye session? Yeah, so if there are no other questions from the students, uh, I would suggest that uh, as we probably you already received an email, but I would suggest that everyone to switch on the 